Hey, this is Mark, and I'm back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week, we have Mike Hamill. And Mike is a guy I met about seven years ago when I went over to Russia to climb a mountain called Mount Elbrus. And Mount Elbrus is Russia's, I mean, actually, is Europe's highest peak. And, uh, you know, he's really been there for me in terms of being uh, my leader, my, my guide up some of these different mountains I've been on and really providing the leadership and guidance on what I need to do to really complete the, the seven summits around the world. And this last year, he decided to take a big risk. And after working for 20 years for the exact same mountaineering uh, 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 guiding company, uh, he decided to to leave and start his own gig called Climbing the Seven Summits. Figure that. So uh, this last year, this last uh, March, April, May, he had his first guided climb on Everest. And all the guys, some of which are my friends, were on that climb. They all summited. So it was a big rousing success for him. And now he continues to expand his offering of taking people up very safely around the world on these different crazy mountains um, that uh, guys like me <laughs> love, to, love to go on. So we get more with Mike a little bit later. But as always, please go into rate and review on iTunes. It really helps in giving us a lift. And we are... Of course, sponsored by Violets or Blue Skincare.com. It's great uh, stuff. It's all natural. Cynthia Besteman, uh, she went through her own adversity and started this all natural skincare line. And if you want to find out anything about what's going on with me, things are always changing, you can go to my website at www.markpattisonnfl.com. And I've got an e learning course that's coming out. I have a book that's coming out. And I'm headed down to Vincent Antarctica, not with Mike. But with another group, all had to do with timing, I look forward to doing that. So you'll be able to track and trace me um, through this new Garmin app that I'm integrating with my website. So that would be very cool to, to see and watch. So on that note, let's go talk to Mike. Here we go. Hey, it's Mark Patterson, and I am back again with another epic episode of Finding Your Summit. And in this case, it might even be finding your way. Today, I've got Michael Hamill. I actually call him Mike Hamill, but he is a world-class mountaineer. I've been on several expeditions with him. Mike, how you doing? Good, Mark. Glad to be here. Yeah, you know, I've been trying to like nail you down now for quite some time, and part of it is logistics, part of it is timing, uh, like all things. But today, I know you're down in Sydney. I think you now call that place home. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been uh, down in Sydney, Australia for year, year and a half now, but it's good to finally connect with you. You know, my lifestyle has me on the road good eight to 10 months a year. Or so I'm always coming and going uh, hard to nail me down, but good to finally connect. Well, it's interesting because I know that you originally originated from Vermont or someplace on the East Coast, Upper East Coast yep. there, and uh, yep. you met a wonderful woman. I've met her. And uh, one thing led to another, and now you find yourself in Sydney, and just a, such a great part of the world. I've been there several times. It is. You know, there's uh, not much for mountains here. If you're a big mountain climber like myself, that's not a, a big draw, but man, it's it's an incredible place. The weather's phenomenal. It's nice to have a little beach time when I'm out of the mountains as well, so it's a nice, nice uh offset to my mountain lifestyle. Well, um, as we talked about prior to going live on the pod, uh, I do live in Sun Valley, Idaho, but today I am beaming from Los Angeles, California. It's nice and warm out here, so similar weather type temps here near the beach, and uh, it, it's just great to have kind of that mountain beach uh, lifestyle, and you certainly are living that. So what I want to do is um, I want to backtrack just a little bit um, because you've just been on this amazing you know journey for a long time, and I think a lot of this theme, this podcast to me, is really about finding your purpose. I mean, we call it finding finding your summit, but I think your summit literally has been on the summits. And it's such a easy, um, oh, I don't know, you get sucked into the corporate world and you feel the world of obligation and you just didn't get caught up in that. So um, let's talk about where you originally found your love of climbing and being in the mountains. Um, yeah, so growing up on the East Coast, I, I spent a lot of time in the mountains. I really cut my teeth on the 
uh, steep rock climbing and ice climbing of the White Mountains and the Adirondacks. And, you know, I think I was just lucky because I found my passion early and that was climbing. You know, I was a big competitive Nordic skier uh, through university and, and that was kind of my passion when I was younger. But once I got turned on the climbing, it was all I could all I could think about. I just wanted to go explore the war, the world and you know climb these mighty peaks. Couldn't get enough reading about the mountains and watching movies about the mountains. So I think in a lot of ways I was just lucky to be to find my passion early. And really, as soon as I got out of university, I took a job as a mountain guide, and one thing led to another. And here I am 20 years later, uh, still a mountain guide, loving the work I do and loving my lifestyle. It, it has its challenges at times and certainly not easy to climb up uh, Mount Everest every year, but it's what I love to do and I'm passionate about it. So I, I consider myself really lucky. Well, yeah, now look, at I, I can certainly understand that. Uh, you started a long time ago. I took a little bit different path, but I did find my way into the mountains, and that's really how I found you. Um, I know that you worked for, for many, many years for a company called IMG, International Mountain Guides. We both have common friends over there. You worked for them, so you probably know all the folks. But, you know, originally when we, I was drawn this thing, this whole thing up with Phil Ursler. Um, I said, look, I'm, I'm really interested in going with somebody who really understands me, understands my vision, where I'm going. And he, he said, look, I've got two guys I think that would be fantastic for you to be with. And I can't remember the, the one guy, but the other guy was you. And I think it was yep. on my, my, my first year I went down to, uh, Tanzania, climbed Kilimanjaro. I came back and the following year I found my way in, in Russia, climb, uh, Mount Elbrus. And, you know, that yeah. uh, each one of these things, as you know, you really find your way and find yourself and, and, and find your weak spots. And, you know, certainly there was a number that I had uh, in my game that need to be honed from nutrition just to what you put yeah. on and, and all those things. And, you know, from day one, you've really been a great mentor to me in terms of really helping educate me in the right way to get up the uh, up the mountain in a safe way and back down. You know, that's that what. That, that to me that that's what makes you who you are and one of the yep. reasons why you've been able to thrive yeah you know there is uh certainly a learning curve to this whole climbing thing a lot of it is getting your systems down as you mentioned getting the the nutrition down and uh i think i think it was just serendipitous that you and i connected uh, early on in your uh climbing career and we could kind of work work our way up through some of these peaks together yeah, so you know, it, it was it was interesting because I'd never been to. I mean, I've been to Europe several times, but certainly never going to Russia. And I think one of the things that I, I finally was the tipping point for me is, um, you know, for years and years and years when my, when my kids were younger, I was always doing the typical vacations, Hawaii or Mexico, and and they're all yeah. good. I mean, it's fantastic, and you go to the big typical resort and with the big pool and all those things. And that's what you do when you yeah. have younger kids, right? Yeah. And yeah. I just got to that point where I, I, it was kind of the tipping point for me where I didn't want to go down that path anymore. And I really wanted to get after this thing called adventure travel. And so yeah. when else, I mean, I've said this several times to many different people about it, it's just not about climbing the seven summits. It's so much of it for yeah. me has really been the journey. And you hear that it's kind of a corny line. It's not about the destination. Yeah. It's the journey. But it really is that. Um, I mean, when else would I be in Moscow? When else would I be in Leningrad, right? St. Petersburg. Yeah. Um, some yeah. of those small towns. I can't even remember where they're called. But, you know, the, the planes, trains, and automobile, automobiles that you and I took to get down yeah. to that ultimate uh, launching <clears throat> point before um, Mount Elbrus. And the training ground. I mean, you just would never do that. And then all these uh, wonderful people that you meet along the way. And some of the people, too, aren't wonderful. You know, they're not yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. not necessarily not wonderful, but they're just – they have no business being in the mountains. But that's just all part yeah. of the game and what you learn. But it's it's really been an amazing journey. Absolutely, yeah. I think, I think that's one of the beautiful things of the Seven Summits um, is the fact that it, it challenges you to – travel to each of the seven continents. I mean, like you say, why else would you go to Antarctica? I mean, maybe you, you'd go see the, the puffins on the, on the coastline or something, but 
that's one of the beauties of the seven summits. It, it forces you to travel. It, it puts you out of your comfort zone. And, um, yeah, it's, that's one of the things I've loved about it. It's been a great education for me. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, so my third mountain, I actually went down to uh, Australia and climbed in the snowy mountains. You mentioned that you know, obviously Australia is not the, the highest of the peaks. There's certainly not that, but Mount Kosciuszko. Yeah. And actually I like to call that the fun seven. I mean, I went down there, and yeah. uh, it was it was a transitional point in time in my life. But I flew into yep. uh, Sydney, where you're at today, and then yep. made my way to the Snowy Mountains, climbed Mount Kosciuszko, and then exited the other direction and flew out of Melbourne and really got to see the country, got to see you know the wonderful people out there and inter- interact. And you know that's not a mountain you necessarily certainly during their summer you need to have a mountain guide, but. It was just no. a, it was just a ton of fun to to get there, but but the next year, let me see, n- uh, number four for me, we found our way down in Argentina and we were climbing in Aconcagua. And it's interesting too, Mike. I'm not sure if you <clears throat> agree with this, but um, it, it seems like unless you go climb that mountain, nobody can say the word Aconcagua. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Certainly not Europeans. They all seem to struggle with it. <laughs> No, it's so funny. But, you know, I, I think that was another one that's, you know, that's another mountain that's just under 23,000 feet. And, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I will always have the utmost respect for you. You've done the seven summits something five or six times. You yeah. You know, made the, 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 the circuit, um, which is incredible. But on that particular day, man, you had some kind of virus and you just could not kick it at yep. that 19,500 foot camp. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. That was the first time that that ever happened to me that I that I wasn't able to summit on a guided climb uh, in the past. I've been sick and, you know, I've been able to muster through and, and get to the top and kind of recover when I get down. But that was a that was definitely an eye opener for me. And I guess it just goes to show that these mountains are the great equalizer and they're all incredibly difficult. Uh, certainly Aconcagua, nearly 23,000 feet in Argentina is a pretty difficult peak. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you just, everyone has good days and bad days. And that was certainly an off day for me. And it's unfortunate that it was, it was uh, summit day, but, uh, definitely was humbling and, uh, an eye opener for me. Yeah. And as you, as you can tell, I'm, I'm kind of doing the chronology of you and I climbing together and, and then yeah. we're going to break off here and go in a different direction. But the following year after that, uh, you and I, this is two years ago now, we were in Alaska. We were trying to climb North America's highest peak, that, that peak that would be Denali, 20,320. We just got stuck at 14,200. And, you know, up top, I remember there was that lenticular cloud. And it was yeah. something like minus 60 or some crazy number. And I actually still have a screenshot that I took that showed a superstorm coming behind that at minus 78. <laughs> and you're like, guys, you know, we're not doing this. So as always, yeah. what, what I think what a lot of people don't understand is that it's almost like a military command where you really yeah. have to have top down. And you, you, if you're the lead guy, which you were, um, yeah. it's just whatever you say ultimately goes, period. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and that was certainly a humbling experience as well. You know, I think a lot of people sign up for some of these climbs or maybe look at the seven summits and think, well, I can just jump on with a guide and everything's going to be fine. But there we were sitting at 14,000 feet. It was minus 40 degrees without wind chill. It was probably, you know, minus 80, minus 90 with wind chill on the summit. And you've got a worse storm coming our way. I mean, that's that's pretty serious, dangerous conditions. And I think we made the right call there uh, bailing out because uh, those that didn't ended up sitting on the mountain for another seven to 10 days. But, you know, very humbling. And uh, it makes you realize that mountains are a dangerous place, certainly uh, Denali for sure. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say too, and well, there's two things that stand out about Denali. Number one is that as we were going up together two years ago, you were saying, look, I have been all over the world. I've climbed every single major peak um, that that is out there, and certainly you've been on Everest a number of times, been in the Himalaya. But you were talking about how the whole Alaskan mountain range to you is the most majestic that's out there. Denali being the most majestic mountain range that is out there, um, and that tops yeah. the Himalaya. Yeah, I I believe that to be true. For me, it's it's the highlight of my year getting up to the Alaska range. It's like 
It's like being in an ice age, absolutely stunning so far north that the the lighting is just so special. And I love that place, but it makes you work for it. That's definitely the hardest climb. Well, you know, physically, it's the hardest climb on the seven summits. You're carrying 120 pounds of gear when you leave base camp. And Everest is, uh, you know, you struggle a lot with the altitude, but you're only carrying a day pack of 15 pounds. So it's a tough one. But I, I always say that I keep going back to Denali because it, I need to prove to myself I'm still a man. I mean, that's uh-huh. a that's a real climb. And, you know, the fact that you had to go back and, and do it again, I'm, I'm glad you got up the, the second time, but we saw the fire and fury on the first, first round up there. Yep. No, n- no question. You know, I was, I was very fortunate to, uh, summit on June 7th and, and the guy that, um, was Victor, who is our guide is a guy that had been up there, I think seven times and made it four. And of the seven times wow. uh, that he he uh, had had uh, been up there and guided, it was the fastest. And we just had spectacular weather the entire time. And I think there's maybe two days later, uh, there was nine feet of snow. And so, you know, to your point, things can turn in in, in a minute, and you got to be prepared yeah. and make the right decisions and go yeah. back and just like it's just not meant to be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's one peak you you never know. I mean, I, re- I remember sitting at high camp with Victor for a week. Uh, we got three or four feet of snow and trying to summit, trying to get to a 20,000 foot summit in four feet of fresh snow is probably the hardest day I've ever had in the mountains. So you just never know with that peak. You know, actually, your name came up when I now, uh, now that uh, you mentioned that, um, when it, it, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys were at high camp up at 17,000. And uh, you guys were going to go and, like, blast a trail across the Audubon, which is super yeah. dangerous and just, like, yeah. incredible that you guys would even think about doing that. <laughs> yeah. It was a hard day. I remember we were kind of swapping leads. Victor would be out front for a bit. I'd, I'd be out front for a bit. And, uh, I mean, at that, at that altitude, walking up steep slopes like that um, through breaking trail through three or four feet of snow – uh, it's just, it, it's incredibly hard. And you know, the fact that we were able to pull off the summit is, is, uh, pretty amazing, but, uh, it was a long, it was a long, tough day. No, incredible. But anyways, you know, as I, as we both have talked about, I, I, I don't know if you're going to go back. I have no desire to go back and take that on again. <laughs> I mean, it was just a mother beast. And, yeah. you know, if the, if the weather wasn't so unpredictable and I'm the one paying for it, you know, maybe yeah. that would be a different answer, but it's not. And so I'm just like, check and I'm not going, I'm not going back. So, yeah. uh, onward and upward. So many years ago, you wrote a book called Climbing the Seven Summits. And I know that not from reading about it, but because I actually have that book and part of my collection that's at my place in Sun Valley, Idaho. And yeah. uh, you were nice enough to to autograph it uh, for me and send that, but it really details all the different and I, 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 all the different mountains that are out there. So I don't know if you were like this was something that you were thinking about of the future, or it's just kind of the way it played out. But you've now transitioned from being a worker bee and guide for yeah. IMG and and the uh, the outfitter up in up in Alaska on Denali to now yeah. actually running your own outfitting guide service called with the same name, Climbing the Seven Summits. So let's go to the book yeah. first. Um, is that something that you were thinking about you know, within the future at the time, or it just made sense to write a book about the mountains that you're climbing? Yeah. Uh, originally, I wasn't thinking about writing a book. Um, the Seven Summits were something that that called to me, so I pretty much ended up climbing the Seven Summits on my own. And Back when I did it, you know, 15, 20 years ago, there wasn't much information out there on the seven summits. So climbs like doing Elbrus in Russia on my own, where no one speaks English, uh, they were they were super difficult. It, it was really hard to find information online, trying to communicate with Russians with broken English. It didn't work well. And a lot of the other peaks were the were the same way. So I just felt like there needed to be a resource out there for people like me that we're trying to accomplish the seven summits. So it made perfect sense to write a book on it and kind of um, accumulate all the knowledge I had learned over the years, guiding and climbing the seven summits in one place. And I presented it to the Mountaineers books in Seattle and they loved the idea and kind of the, the rest is history there. 
Well, uh, for anybody that is interested in that book, it's fantastic and, and it's got just a, yeah, just a boatload of fantastic, uh, pictures, um, that really describe being kind of the who, what, where, how. And, uh, like you said, it's kind of a, you know, a, a jack of all trades. Here's, if you're going to go take this stuff on, this is the way you go about doing it with recommendations on outfitters and, you know, so it's, it's just a great resource. Um, uh, where can people find that book, by the way? Uh, I've got it on my, my website, uh, climbing the seven summits.com, the, the top of the page, you'll see, uh, the book, uh, tab there. Uh, it's also on Amazon as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So we're going to put that in the show notes a little bit later. Um, I want to talk about Everest, as you know, I'm headed there in March of 2020 and, uh, yep. I know that you, this is, I think this last year was your first, so there's two parts of this. One, you've been on top of Everest five times. The second thing is last yep. year was your first expedition as your own company. And I think all the guys, some of the guys I, I actually have climbed with, but everybody made it to the top safely and back down. Absolutely. A hundred, hundred percent success, uh, last spring, which was, uh, pretty cool for my first, it was my 10th expedition, uh, to Mount Everest, but it was the first one through my company climbing the seven summits. So to have everyone stand on top of both Everest and Lhotse was just such an amazing feeling for me. It, it made me feel like I was doing the right thing. Like we had a great pr program in place and, uh, you know, that was a great launching pad for me, uh, for the company. And I've got a, a ton of interest for Everest, uh, this coming spring, I think because everything went so smoothly last year. So it was, it was great to be able to climb with a bunch of good friends, uh, clients last year and, and just see everyone be successful. Yeah. So let's talk about Lotsi and the kind of the combo. Is that an option or is that it's just part of the, the the thing that you offer that's different from everybody else, or does everybody do that that combo trip? Uh, it's very rare to do that combo trip. Um, it's getting less rare. I I think I think probably um, ten to fifteen guided clients have uh, accomplished it now, but it's absolutely a huge feat. I mean, to to climb Everest alone is a massive feat, but then to come back down to the South Call after Everest get a few hours of rest on oxygen and then head back out to climb the fourth tallest peak on earth, uh, Lhotse within 24 hours is, is just, uh, it's, it's a, it's a very hard thing to do. Let's put it that way. So, uh, it's becoming more common, but it's only been done by handful of people in history. And, uh, uh, if someone feels confident and incompetent at altitude and is going to tackle Everest, I think that's a great challenge. So if, if I, if I get this right, so you, what you, what you offer with climbing the seven summits.com is a guided tour, not tour, but a guided expedition up to the top of Everest and back. And if yep. somebody wants to also take on Lhotse, then you package that together and you make that happen. Ab absolutely. Yeah. There's a, you know, a separate permit fee for Lhotse, but really the costs associated with Lhotse because it's not Everest. Everyone wants to climb Everest. So the permit fees there are, are uh, much higher. Uh, to tag on Lhotse is not that much more expensive. And then, you know, you really put yourself in the record books summiting two 8,000 meter peaks in 24 hours, which is a, a pretty cool thing to do. Yeah, I think Matt Wood accomplished that, correct? He did. He did, yeah. And he was, uh, you know, I think as I mentioned, maybe 10 guided clients have done it and maybe 20, 25 people in history. So he's in the record books for that now. Wow. That's incredible. So, you know, kudos certainly to Matt, if you're listening. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. So let's talk about Everest just in general. I mean, that, that mountain has brought a lot of controversy. You were involved. I want to talk to you more about this in 2008. There was a reality yeah. documentary that you were involved in. Um, yeah. what exactly did you do? with that film this podcast is brought to you by Laird Superfoods let me tell you these creamers are so amazing they're super tasty super delicious and what they are is whole natural food ingredients mixed into these creamers and I, I'm telling you when you put this, this stuff into your drink this powder substance 
It is amazing. And their whole tagline is all about fueling your journey. You cannot go and actually power your way up a mountain, uh, be in the pool, ride a big wave, uh, unless you're properly fueled. And these guys are doing it all the right way. So where can you find this? At LairdSuperfood.com. And here's the kicker. If you use the, the, the code name Mark. P20, that's Mark P20, you're going to get 20% off on your first order. So check it out, LairdSuperfood.com. Do you more about this? In 2008, there was a reality yeah. documentary that you were involved in. Um, yeah. What exactly did you do with that film? That uh, TV show, Everest Beyond the Limits, uh, basically I was hired as a uh, both talent and a filmer. So I was carrying a camera the whole time. I had this massive five pound battery in my pack and I had this, uh, um, camera strapped to my head. And so I was filming the whole way, which was, which is pretty cool. It was a new experience for me, but I was also talent. So they were documenting me in the program. So they followed my climb, uh, with my clients, and uh, basically just kind of showed uh, what what an Everest expedition is like. Yeah, that's great. I actually remember watching, maybe I downloaded season one and two or something that is on there. And I, I don't remember your part in that. But then again, I, you know, that was a couple of years ago and I can't really remember yeah. anything other than, you know, there was, you know, there was a lot of controversy and people bickering and arguing and yeah. trying to get up the, the face and altitude sickness and all kinds of stuff. So, um, I know, and, and my, my date is ex escaping me this exact moment. I remember this clearly because you and I were texting back and forth, and I was concerned for your for your safety. But you were yeah. over there when that massive earthquake hit, and all that that pitch came flying down the hit uh, the hill and like took out Camp One. You may have been at Camp Two at the time when all that happened. I I was at base camp. There were actually two avalanches consecutive years in 2014 and 2015, I believe. Uh, 2014, there was a massive avalanche that came off in the ice fall that uh, that killed 16 Sherpa. Yeah, uh, that was obviously a huge tragedy, and I was there for that year and helping with the rescue of the Sherpa and, and the bodies and all that. And, but I think, uh, the, the incident that you're referring to was in 2015 when there was a math massive earthquake in Nepal and that earthquake triggered an avalanche that came down and took out almost all of base camp and killed 19 people almost instantly. Uh, I was there for that, for that as well. And it's interesting. I went to a film festival the other day and i i saw some footage of someone capturing that moment the avalanche hitting camp um and it was the first time i had seen that footage since actually being in that situation and it just brought back so many memories and feelings from that it was it was a very intense uh situation to be a part of and you know i, I was lucky to survive i just got hit by the blast no rocks came through our camp um, but immediately I knew that other people had been killed or injured. So, uh, myself and a couple other guides, we went out and started trying to pick up the pieces, help as many people as we could and, you know, kind of triage the situation and really dealing with, with the rescue and repatriation of bodies, but also trying to keep people alive. And, you know, it was just a good two, three days of setting up these makeshift shift hospitals in our camp. And uh, it, just trying to keep people alive. It was it was an incredibly desperate situation at base camp. Uh, I believe 10,000 people uh, across Nepal died uh, from that earthquake. So it was it was a it was a huge uh, just a huge um, I don't know tragedy. Uh, but I was at base camp for that. That's where we got hit the worst. There were some people on the mountain at Camp One and Camp Two. And surprisingly, that's a very tight uh, valley up there. So my first concern was that they had gotten hit by avalanches up there. They were actually fine, and we were able to get helicopters up there and get them out of there, and everyone, everyone was okay up there. It was us at base camp that got hit the hardest. So the reason why you had helicopters is because the Kumba ice fields had completely shifted, or why couldn't they just climb back down? 
Exactly. The, uh, the earthquake had changed the route. All the fixed lines through the Kumbu icefall had fallen down. Uh, so there was no way for people to move up and down the mountain. So the only way to get people out of there was to fly helicopters up, pick them up and bring them down, which, which is pretty dangerous. The pilots, the heli pilots over there, are some of the best in the world and they felt comfortable with it. Uh, it was certainly safer than having the climbers come back, try and come back down through the Kumbu icefall. So, uh, we flew probably 50, helicopter trips up the mountain to get people out of there and everyone was was fine they were very shaken up as you can imagine being trapped on mount everest but everyone was fine so i can't begin to imagine okay so there's two 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 levels of this right so you're at base camp and it's it's like you said triage situation and it's just it's awful and yep. uh, you're trying to make the best of everything and at the same time people are now trying to like okay Somehow or another, I, I have to get back to Kathmandu and get out of there. But that had been destroyed as well, right? So you, it's just the entire yeah. infrastructure was a wreck. And yeah. you're trying to figure out how to, you know, survive, get back. And it's not like, you know, across the valley. I mean, it's it's a significant um, track to get back, right, to probably Lucka. And then from there, you got to fly out to, to Kathmandu. And then from Kathmandu, back yeah. to the States or wherever you're yeah. going to. Yeah, the entire country was shut down. As I mentioned, 10,000 10, people were killed from this earthquake across Nepal. So uh, everything was shut down. The, the uh, airports were shut down. So basically what we did was, you know, we, we kind of stayed at, at base camp for a few days and dealt with the rescue and repatriation of bodies there. And then we headed down the valley, but all the tea houses were destroyed uh, we didn't feel comfortable staying in them because they were, you know, walls had fallen down and they were they were unsafe to go inside of. So we kind of slowly camped our way down the valley, basically buying time to for the uh, airports to reopen so that we could even consider going home. So it was this very strange feeling of almost being in purgatory, like you couldn't climb the mountain, but you couldn't go home either. So we basically took our time heading down the valley. We went to Forte where a lot of our Sherpa live and we tried to do what we could to help them rebuild uh, some of their tea houses and houses. So, you know, we tried to make use of that time, but it was uh, it, it was a pretty emotional time. We had we'd watched uh, friends and relatives of some of our Sherpa die. And we had flown their bodies out of there, and then we're just kind of stuck in this in this purgatory. So it was a really it was a really strange time. Yeah. So how long did you end up being in the country beyond what you would have normally been there? Well, uh, that was early on in the expedition, and uh, obviously we cut the expedition short. So we went home. We flew home probably a month before we would have yeah. had we kept climbing, but we were probably another two weeks after the accident before we could even get on a flight back home out of, out of Nepal. Yeah, man, that's, well, look at, you know, knock on wood, you're still here today. And yeah. I, 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 a lot of times when people look at me who don't know anything about mountain climbing, we start talking about, you know, safety and they fear for me and all this stuff. And, and I, and I really believe it's either bad luck or stupidity. And that what you just talked about right yeah. now is bad luck. Um, you know, you yeah. have once in every hundred years, you've got an earthquake that comes down and, 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 uh, or that just rattles the entire country. And then you have these avalanches that just happen to come in position where they're taking out base camp. And then the other part of that is stupidity. Um, I, I yeah. look at into thin air, that whole mess that happened in 1996. And there's yeah. just one thing after the other in terms of what the guides did and what yeah. the people did and trying to climb in a super storm and go beyond what they should yeah. have been and blah, blah, blah. And, and, yeah. you know, bad things happen. And just like, you know, yeah. you and I turned around on Denali two years ago because we didn't want those types of things. Our toes yeah. and our fingers are more invaluable than, than taking the top. And that's what has, you know, you, you have to be disciplined if you want to play in this game. Absolutely. I, I, you know, you bring up Denali from a couple of years ago. There were people that were pushing up through that terrible weather when we were sitting at 14 and they were getting frostbite and, um, 
you know, you, there, there are always people like that. There are people like that on Everest that probably shouldn't be there or they're too gung ho or they're willing to sacrifice uh, fingers and toes for the summit when they don't necessarily need to. And those are mostly the people that get into trouble and you hear about. And that's why everyone thinks Everest is so dangerous. And, you know, certainly Everest is dangerous, but you can mitigate a lot of those risks. And if you're, if you know what you're doing or you're with a reputable guide service, those ri- those risks are pretty low. And when you compare climbing Everest uh, to 50 years ago compared to now, uh, it's much, much safer. We've got an incredible infrastructure in place in terms of fixed lines, uh, you know, the ice fall doctors. We've got communication devices like sat phones and radios. We've got incredible weather for- forecasting capabilities. So all those things add up to make it a much safer experience. So while Mount Everest will will never be safe, it's much safer now than it ever has been in the past. Yeah, that, that's great news for me since I'm going to be there in about <laughs> 13 months, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I got to tell you, though, the, the one thing that, that is really frustrating to me, and as you know, I played in the NFL, I played on a major yeah. college football team in Washington, and yeah. it's just kind of like the cream of the crop, crop rose to the top, and, um, you know, you end up playing with D1 or NFL caliber talent, and the guys who don't make the cut, don't make the grade, they're yeah. out. They don't play, yeah. they don't make the team, whatever it is. And when you take a person like myself, who I'm not a professional guide, and I rely on your expertise and your your experience over all these different mountains you've climbed to help me get up and down safely, I yeah. know because... I know what I do when I train. I know my power. I know my strengths. I'm also mixing and putting my life on the same rope team of other people I've never climbed with before. I don't have yeah. the luxury of saying, hey, Mike and Ed Veesters and some other guys I know, let's go climb this mountain. I'm not I'm not in that level. I'm not that, that, that place in life. And yeah. so just like what we had two years ago where we had this Taiwanese guy that – you know, yeah. you guys do the best that you can to sort through and just and, and try to evaluate whether or not people can be on the mountain. You know, we end up with somebody who's not helping, that lays down on the mountain, that becomes very dangerous, not only for himself, but for everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. And it's it's most apparent on Mount Everest. You know, pretty much anyone that wants to sign up for an Everest climb can sign up and the reputable companies won't take just anyone. They, they want to see you have a resume in place and they want to make sure you're successful. But if you hire on with a cheap Nepali company or something like that, then they'll take you, they'll, they'll cash that check. And those are a lot of the people that are getting into, into trouble on Mount Everest. And you know, it, it's tough to put it in the hands of the Nepalese government because we do see quite a bit of uh, corruption there. But it, it kind of seems like the Nepalese government needs to put some controls in place, like people need to have a certain resume or, uh, you know, something along those lines. It, it seems like people need to be regulated a little bit more based on skill before they can just jump on Mount Everest, because those are the people that year after year end up getting into trouble and that's why Mount Everest has the reputation that it does have. And, uh, you know, it's pretty unfortunate. It's, it's tragic. Uh, I, I remember the last time I summited 2016 on summit day, there was a team, uh, an Indian team that were obviously unprepared. I remember seeing them throughout the course of the expedition and they they all had the same matching gear on they had bought just before the climb. Obviously, a, an Indian guide service had brought them along and maybe painted it like a Kilimanjaro climb. And everyone knew that they were ill prepared. And sure enough, on summit day, three of, of these climbers ended up dying. And it's tragic to see that. And yeah, I think if there were if 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 the guide companies it took more of the burden on themselves to filter out people based on their resume and not just cash any check. Um, and also maybe the government regulating things a bit more, we wouldn't see things like that. And, uh, 
and Mount Everest would be a much safer place. So when you when you peel it back a little bit and you start talking about all these mountains, your new company, Climbing the Seven Summits, uh, offers around the world, what is your filter? Uh, well, certainly for something like Mount Everest, uh, you know, generally I don't take a, a client for Mount Everest that I haven't climbed with in the past. I like to know, you know, their climbing resume and, and who they are in the mountains. And, you know, if someone has a really long climbing resume, then, then I might take them without knowing them. But, you know, in, in general, I just want people to be successful. So I want to see people have a progression of mountains uh, obviously, I don't want to see someone sign up for Aconcagua that hasn't climbed at altitude before. They haven't been to Elbrus or Kilimanjaro. I think, you know, there needs to be a proper progression. And that means uh, getting some skills training down low, doing uh, Kilimanjaro, doing an Elbrus first, and then walking, working your way up through the Denali's, the Aconcaguas, and then thinking about Choyu and, and Mount Everest. So, you know, that's kind of my philosophy and it's worked really well. I, you know, as you mentioned, uh, we had a hundred percent success on Everest on my first year. And I think a lot of that, a lot of that is because I had climbed with everyone on the team. I knew their capabilities. I knew their strengths and weaknesses, and I was able to work towards that to make sure they were successful. So are you, uh, sticking on Everest, uh, are you now in a position where you're going to Everest and you've got your infrastructure in place, so now you're the main guy in the tent and, uh, you know, preparing what the day's going to look like, and then you're assigning guys to various Sherpa, and then they're going up the mountain, you're staying more at base camp and, and really monitoring the weather, the, the diet, you know, what's going on, when are you guys going to go, who's who's strong, who's weak? Is that kind of more your role now? Ab- absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm less on the mountain these days. I'm more coaching from base camp and uh, kind of overseeing the entire expedition as expedition leader. So I'm dealing with logistics, weather, uh, personalities, making sure everyone's taken care of, making sure – the Sherpa are where they need to be. The climbers are where they they need to be. So I'm kind of the one person at base camp overseeing the entire expedition and then hiring other guides and Sherpa to go up the mountain and take care of things up there for me. And, you know, obviously I'm in touch with everyone on the mountain uh, via radio, but my my job and where I'm most effective is being at base camp and kind of moving the chess pieces from there. Yeah, got it. So, so uh, again, you're climbing the Seven Summits, uh, new adventure outfitting, all to do with with climbing mountains throughout the world. How many different expeditions, climbs, whatever you want to call this, uh, do you offer now to people who want to climb with you? Uh, we've got, I think, 10 or 12 uh, expeditions uh, offered on the website now. Obviously, you know, you consider my name, Climbing the Seven Summits. That's that's my focus. I focus on the tallest peak on each continent, the the seven summits. But we also offer expeditions to Choyu, Mexico, uh, Ecuador, uh, some treks like Everest Base Camp treks, Machu Picchu, uh, Torres del Paine in in Patagonia. And um, you know, I, I definitely want to keep my focus on the seven summits. But we've got a wide variety of of offerings, basically covering the great, the great mountains, uh, throughout the world. Well, if you need a personal guide to work for you on, uh, Bora in, uh, Idaho, <laughs> highest mountain, I'm your guy. All right. There we go. Yeah. I'll, hey, I'll keep in touch. Hey, so, um, tell me one, as I kind of wrap this up, um, I want to ask you about Choi Yu. It's, uh, in yeah. the Himalaya, uh, it might be the 14th highest mountain in the world. And I know you and I have talked about myself going, um, and taking that on is kind yep. of a, uh, you know, the next step, uh, before you take on Everest. But tell me why yep. that mountain is special to you. Uh, Choi Yu is pretty special to me because it was my first 8,000 meter peak. It was, it was the first big climb I did in the Himalayas. And, uh, for me, it was just a paradigm shift. You know, I, I showed up on this Choi Yu expedition. I was 24 year old kid and, I remember standing on the Tibetan plateau looking up at Choi Yu and a tear kind of came to my eye. I was, it was so intimidating to look at, at this peak at nearly 27,000 feet, the world's sixth tallest mountain. 
And, uh, you know, I, I didn't know what I had gotten myself into. And luckily, everything went smoothly. I, I climbed well and was able to stand on top. But it being my first really big uh, uh, mountain, the first Himalayan 8,000 meter peak, it's always held a, a special place in my heart. And I've led uh, 11 expeditions there now. I've actually summited that peak more than any other non-Sherpa. And I love getting back there every year. I love the cultural aspect of that. But, you know, I think the 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 special thing about Choyu is that it's a perfect stepping stone for Everest. If people want to see how their body does at 8,000 meters and get get to know the Sherpa and use the oxygen systems, um, I think that's that's the best training you can get for Mount Everest. And I think that's why it's so popular. You know, people want to it's it's a much cheaper way to see how you do at altitude before committing to Everest and uh, success on Everest goes way up amongst people that have um, trained on Choi Yu. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I would love to do that mountain, by the way. So I've got yeah. Vincent in my sights, as you know, coming up in January. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, the only reason why I'm not going with you is timing, and that's it. So we can start planning our, our Everest uh, expedition, and I've got a whole roster trying to work on an NFL deal at NFL Networks that um, awesome. hopefully you might be filming with us. So we need to stay uh, in close contact on that. On how Absolutely. that might, yeah, that whole the whole thing is going to shape up. The last question for you is this: is that I, I know that that it's been kind of knee deep in your mind now for a couple of years about you know taking the risk and and kind of jumping off the cliff with both feet in terms of uh, starting this new company, right? Yep. And so you've always yep. had the security of, of being one of the top guides for IMG. Um, and you didn't have to really carry the, the infrastructure of everything else that's going on. And you finally took the jump, finally took yep. the leap. And what has been the most satisfying thing at the end of the days you've gone through your logo and planning this yeah. thing and designing your website and all the things you have to do to, to just create the foundation? What's been yeah. the thing that has given you the most satisfaction and joy to date? I, I think just creating a company in my image, you know, this is my baby. And um, as you mentioned, you know, I always had that security of working for someone else. And it is scary to to make that leap and, and do your own thing as being a small business owner is is not easy. But to be able to craft a company in your image is just so powerful. I've got I've got passion back for what I'm doing for mountain climbing. And I think I was starting to lose that a little bit, just going through this continuous cycle of climbing peaks for, for someone else. Now that it's my baby and everything I do, uh, benefits me, uh, it's, it's really powerful. And at the end of the day, that's been the best thing for me is just, you know, I, I, I pour so much more kind of love into these trips and my clients and communicating with clients just because it's, it's it's my baby. It's it's what I love to do, and it's I've kind of find that found that passion again. That's awesome. That's that's. I mean, that's look. That's what life is all about, and yeah. it's just so many people. I mean, I'm metaphorically speaking now, or or you know, they always want to go off. They want to do their own thing, but it's really putting those those ten toes on the cliff and, yeah. and jumping. I don't mean literally, of course, but but yeah. um, you know, just taking that risk and just know that things are going to work out. And with you, uh, I think. More than probably anybody I know, it's really where prepar preparation met opportunity. So, you know, for 20 yep. plus years, you, you've been doing this, you honed your game, you knew all these, these, uh, other guides from, from these various countries, you knew where to go. How, I mean, you just yep. like, you literally had this thing down and now it was just the time to like go and you did. And, uh, yep. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy for you and, uh, you're a good dude and, and you deserve yeah. all the success, you know, coming forward. And, and the great yeah. thing about all this is that for you, it's just only beginning and you've yeah. got such a, uh, uh, so many great things ahead of you that I'm excited about and will continue to follow you and climb with you. And, awesome. um, I really appreciate you being on the pod today. Yeah. I appreciate it, Mark. Good to, good to connect with you. You know, always, Awesome to get caught up and uh, yeah. look forward to catching you on uh, Everest when we go do that mountain, okay? Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. You got it. 
Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So, until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.